It's a small organization, uh, deliberately so. We, uh, we keep it that way by a fairly selective criteria. It comprises about now about 380 of probably the uh, best known senior former diplomats, the United States, including uh, many career ambassadors, but some non-career, some military, some uh, from the uh, AID background, intelligence. And it has two, Academy has two main purposes. One is to suggest to the State Department and Congress how American diplomacy might better be organized. Sometimes that's welcome. Uh, so, sometimes, I suppose, we're a bit of a gadfly, but we actually have moved some legislation and we're working on some more right now. Our other main uh, effort is directed toward talking to Americans generally about what diplomacy is, why it's important to them, why they should support it. And within the talking to Americans, a, sort of a subpart, but one which we care about a great deal is helping attract the best qualified people to the Foreign Service and to take the Foreign Service exam. And uh, so one of the things that I think probably many of you on the call already know is that if you take the Foreign Service exam, you have to declare your specialization or track or cone before you take the exam. If you screw that up, you are in trouble because if you pass, that's the cone you're going into. And if you don't like it, that's going to be tough because you'll be there for a while. My colleagues who are currently serving officers will explain this to you more diplomatically and in greater detail. Uh, but the basic thing is you need to get this right. And so it's our great pleasure to be doing a series of, I believe, five of these talks that we're going to do about each of the cone, cones to try to give people a little more sense and texture about the profession. And to do that, we're going to have a discussion moderated by Yolanda Kennedy uh, with uh, Minya Houston, who is the DIR for South Florida, and with Ambassador Tom Dory, who is a retired ambassador, who was in the PD Cone. And our purpose is to give you a kind of back and forth, what it was like then, what it's like now, a sense of the career at a variety of points in the career. So with that introduction, let me pass to Yolanda. Thank you so much, Ambassador Newman, and our thanks to the Academy for uh, co-hosting with us. Uh, I hope that you all, all our participants, understand what a treasure we have in Ambassador Newman. Uh, whether he is speaking frankly, diplomatically or not, he is full of, uh, of really good insights. And so I look forward to hearing from him this evening. We have with us also Ambassador Tom Doherty, as you've heard, he is a um, public diplomacy career track officer, a former ambassador, and his bio was uh, was sent to you. But I would like for Ambassador Doty to tell us just a little bit about, tell us about yourself, where you served, and your PD highlight, if you will. Um, thank you very much, and it's really great to be with you. You know, as Ambassador Newman said, it really is an important choice that uh, you make when you decide which of the tracks that you're most interested in. And obviously tonight you're gonna to be hearing from a lot of people who think public diplomacy is one that's very interesting. Um, I joined um, what was then the United States Information Agency in 1989 and had a 27 and a half year career in public diplomacy. Um, was around in 1999 when USIA um, was consolidated into the State Department. Um, and had what, for me, um, looking back at it, was kind of the ideal um, career in that it was all a big surprise all the way along. Um, everything that happened was um, um, a bit unexpected, which is a characteristic that anyone going into the Foreign Service should, should have, but um, spent most of my career in the Middle East and particularly in Africa, but also in Australia and in Europe as well. Um, served as a public um, diplomacy officer in a variety of posts in the Middle East, Germany, and um, throughout Africa. And also had the perspective of doing a couple of other things. I was a DCM three times, a deputy chief of mission three times, 
um, and also served um, as, as an ambassador once, which gives you a different perspective because then you see public diplomacy in a broader area from the whole mission point of view. So very happy to be with you um, this evening. So, thanks. Thank you. From um, our diplomat in residence for South Florida is Mignon Houston. Mignon, tell us a little bit about yourself and your PD uh, work so far and your PD highlight, if there is one. Fantastic. And thank you for having me to the Academy. Thank you for this great panel. I have to say, starting out that Yolanda is a PD mentor of mine. So it's always fantastic to work with her on events. My name is Mignon Houston and I joined the Foreign Service in 2006. So it's been about 15 years working as a diplomat and I am public diplomacy combed. My first assignment, I was in Guadalajara, Mexico. And my second assignment was in Cameroon and Yaoundé. I then went on to serve in the Philippines and then I returned to Washington DC to work as a press officer for, at that time we had a special envoy for Sudan and South Sudan. And my second assignment in Washington was as a public diplomacy desk officer covering the Caribbean. And this is covering our US missions in the 21 countries in the Caribbean. We have uh, a number of missions out there. And so I was supporting those public diplomacy sections from Washington. And my most recent assignment was in Cape Town, South Africa also as a PD assignment. And I'm currently, as Yolanda mentioned, a diplomat in resident serving in Miami, Florida, covering Southern Florida, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, recruiting for the State Department on our internships, fellowships, and careers at the Department of State. And as a PD highlight, I like to tell people this story that I came in as a graduate student, uh, but in college, I studied communications and Spanish. I thought I wanted to be a journalist. And I had a professor one day ask me, did I want to report the news or did I want to make the news? And I thought, well, you can do both. And he said, yeah, you really need to think about it and, and think about the Foreign Service. That might give you an opportunity to do a little bit of both. And he was absolutely right. And so tonight we get a chance to tell you as public diplomacy officers, how not only do we help report on the news, but we also help make it. And so I'm so excited about this panel and working with Yolanda and all of the distinguished guests we have today. Thank you. And so I'm Yolanda Kearney. I'm the diplomat in residence for the DC metro region. I cover DC, West Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. I am uh, sort of the flip side of the coin uh, from Mignon, uh, who ha we happen to be very good friends. We serve in Cameroon, not together. Uh, I was cultural affairs officer there. And then after me, Mignon came into that post. Uh, I am not a journalist. I was a music historian at the Library of Congress before I joined the Foreign Service. So the cultural side of the house is, uh, is what I came into the Foreign Service to do. And I am um, going to moderate for us this evening. I have several PD highlights. And for that reason, I'm not going to take a lot of time because I think we're going to cover some of them as we start to have our, our discussion. So as Ambassador Newman noted, we really want to help you. Everyone here on this panel wants to help you understand what the practice of public diplomacy is. It's a question mark. If you Google public diplomacy, you get all sorts of, oh, it's this or it's that. We're gonna tell you what it means from the State Department's perspective. We'll talk a little bit about that history because I think it's important for you to understand from whence we come. So first, the mission of USIA, the US Information Agency, was to understand, inform, and influence foreign publics in promotion of national interest and to broaden the dialogue between Americans and US institutions and their counterparts abroad. So what does that mean exactly? Well, USIA was uh, formed in 1953 under President Eisenhower. This was the middle of the Cold War. Uh, we had some pretty strong thoughts about how we as a nation should present ourselves. So. We did all sorts of really beautiful things. This was the beginning and the birth of Voice of, uh, of America. USIA published uh, some 60 magazines and newspapers and other periodicals in 28 languages, maintained libraries, engaged in cultural exchange programs, like our flagship programs, the Fulbright Exchange. So everything was going along swimmingly until at the end of, uh, of USIA, uh, as we know it, in uh, 1999, it, it went away as an agency and came into the State Department. And you may ask why. The shift in the focus was the mission. It was uh, the mission of USIA to go to the PD career track in uh, the Department of State really centers on the goal of advancing national interests. So once upon a time, it was very important to be the, the face of the news and to give that news. The internet made that 
almost uh, impossible to get ahead of that news cycle. So first, Ambassador Doherty, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the major differences that you saw in the practice of public diplomacy from USIA through the transition into the State Department and then toward uh, the end of your career. Um, thanks, Yolanda. So, you know, I did mention when I joined um, the, 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 the Foreign Service, the um, system was a little bit different then. You took the exam um, and then you heard back if you were lucky enough and you were told, well, you're eligible to be in public affairs, you're eligible to be management, consular, political, economic, and then you would, or commercial service at that time as well. And then you would choose depending on where you were ranked on various lists. I mean, I chose to go into USIA. I had the advantage, I think, of um, living overseas and I applied um, from overseas and have quite a number of friends that were working in embassies in Europe. And I sat down and talked with a lot of them. They were all doing really interesting jobs. But for me, what was most interesting were the, um, was the work that was being done by people that I knew, um, some very junior and some very senior in USIA. It seemed to cover um, all of the things that I was interested in, um, those people to people type of um, relationships that make living and working overseas really very exciting. Um, and was told at the time um, by a, a senior USIA, he said, well, I think you should do USIA. I think you'd be great at it, but you need to recognize the fact that um, if you choose that, you're never gonna be an ambassador. Um, and that was fine. Um, I think everyone should go into the, 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 the track that is of greatest interest to them and the career starts taking care of itself as long as what you are doing is what really interests you and what you um, think um, is really your passion. So um, unlike a lot of people, so I was 10 years um, then with USIA um, before it was consolidated into the State Department. And you can imagine an agency that had been around for a long time. And I think it was important at the beginning that that separateness by USIA, and it was decided during the um, time of the Cold War to keep a, a, a bit of, uh, bureaucratic distance between the State Department and USIA it added a degree of, um, or said to offer a degree of objectivity. And, and um, uh, you could talk to people without them thinking that what you were saying to them was necessarily being reported back to an embassy or that whatever you were saying was always the company line. Um, by 1999, though, as, as, as Yolanda mentioned, um, a decision had been made to consolidate USIA into the State Department. For many people that had been around USIA for 10, 20, 30 years, um, it was a bit traumatic. Um, for many others, it wasn't at all. And I have to say, in most respects, I didn't find and never did find the work terribly different after 1999 than before 1999. Um, in other words, I think what we were doing in USIA before 1999 was promoting the US national interest as well. Um, we were sitting down with people in a lot of type of events in cultural events, in, in press work, just um, as public diplomacy officers do now with the State Department um, and had the opportunity as part of the country team in, a, in an um, embassy structure um, to share what we were learning, what we were hearing um, and to shape the policy direction in that respect. So I didn't see too many changes. Um, one thing that um, did change a little bit is that USIA with a different name, with a different moniker, and at that point, usually um, separate offices from the embassy um, in um, times where security restrictions were, were, were less um, apparent as they are now. So a cultural center would usually be off of the embassy compound. So it's a little bit easier to interact with people. Um, but beyond that, I don't find that the, the, the consolidation has had um, many negatives. Um, in the same way that you as a USIA officer could encourage debate, even um, negative um, feedback from foreign audiences about US policies, you still can within the State Department. It's your job to explain what the State Department's um, point of view is and, and what policy is, but it's also your job to listen to how others react to that and how they interpret it, and even to explain that in the United States, some people think this and some people think that. So in that respect, um, um, a few changes. Security meant that more often than not, we are on the embassy compound, so it takes a little bit more effort for us 
to get out in the community, but it's effort that's really worth taking. And then one advantage that I think um, is important is in a more integrated structure with the State Department, um, we work a little bit more closely and sometimes more productively with our colleagues in other agencies and sections. And we also have the opportunity, which um, is, is true no matter which track that you decide that you're most interested in, to be involved in all of the tracks in the State Department. So in that sense, I see the integration as a net plus for public diplomacy um, and didn't find that the, the, the transition to be particularly difficult. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, Ambassador Newman, I'd love your perspective on this also, but for both ambassadors, I'd like to talk a little bit about the structure of the Undersecretariat of Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. Um, noting for folks out there who are thinking of sitting the exam uh, that public diplomacy generally is when we engage foreign audiences and public affairs is when we engage domestically. So let's talk about two of the, the big bureaus, um, a big you know, bureaus under that undersecretariat. The first is the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. And if you're thinking about public diplomacy as a career, this is probably what you're thinking about. This uh, is the unit of the Bureau that's responsible for designing and implementing educational, professional, and cultural exchange programs. So we're talking Cadillac programs, Fulbright, Humphrey. This is where you're going to find our sports diplomacy um, exchanges as well. All of the, the really big, splashy, oh, that's what the embassy does programs really emanate, many of them do, from the Educational and Cultural Affairs Bureau. And then the second, the flip side of that coin, this is in Mignon's um, backyard, is the Bureau of Global Public Affairs. So that bureau is responsible for communicating U.S. foreign policy, the priorities that we have, and the importance of diplomacy to American audiences and to engaging foreign audiences to enhance the understanding of said US foreign policy. This is where you're going to find our foreign press centers, the office of the spokesperson, the global web platforms. So as you are looking at our uh, embassy websites because you wanna familiarize yourself with how the department communicates and how we're structured, you will notice that many of our websites look very similar, if not identical in some instances. And that's because in Washington, there's a general standard that is applied to the way that we communicate and including the look of that, um, of that communication. So for both ambassadors, I'm curious, from the ambassador's um, standpoint, you're at your mission, you have your public affairs officer and you want your public affairs officer to do X exchange or X program. Tell me how, you envision or how you know that relationship to be from the public affairs officer in the field communicating with Washington back in Washington. And then Mignon and I are going to tell you where things go way sideways. Well, I, I might just make a comment. First of all, I think when you're in the field as an ambassador, and I was ambassador three times. I was ambassador in Algeria uh, in the middle of an extremely bloody insurgency. Uh, about a thousand people a month were getting killed. Uh, and we had a position of pushing the government for certain, uh, both human rights and political issues. I was ambassador in Bahrain, which was a good deal quieter, although the embassy got stormed by mobs at one point. Uh, and I was ambassador in Afghanistan, which was not quiet. Uh, I was also a senior officer in Iraq for three years, where I watched how too much spin on our press briefing totally destroyed our credibility. Uh, with the journalists, and we used, to, we used to refer to it as the Daily Follies. Uh, but I'll just make two comments about the, uh, the role of the public diplomacy officer when I was ambassador. Uh, one was that I really looked to the public diplomacy officer as much or more than the political officer to be monitoring the local media, press, everything, because they have to tell me what's working, where the criticism is, what do we have to answer? Uh, and the political officer is gonna be doing that too, but he's or she is going to be looking at a broad spectrum of opinion, uh, informal opposition groups, whatever. The public diplomacy officer is giving me what's, what's, hitting, the, what's hitting the press, what's hitting the Twitter feeds, uh, you know, big, big stuff. And they've got to be able to say, Mr. Ambassador, this line coming out of Washington, this isn't working. This, this doesn't fly. 
And this is why. And then it's up to me as the ambassador to tell Washington, ahem, you got a problem. Uh, but it's also up to me to shape our use of their line in a way that will be effective. And there's a terribly important advisory role for the public diplomacy officer. The flip side of that is for the public diplomacy officer head, and we're really talking about the press function now more than the cultural, to, to do their job well. They have to be very close to policy. They need to be in many of the most important meetings the ambassador has, the internal meetings, because they have to really understand what the policy is in order to defend it. If they don't, then they're gonna end up with a bunch of wooden talking points that sound like they were written by a bureaucrat and they're, you know, frankly, they're about as useful as an ashtray on a motorcycle. They don't convince anybody of anything. Um, and the, I'll tell you the most useful advice I ever got for public diplomacy, uh, when I was in Algeria, a very good friend of mine now passed away, was in Algeria, and he had managed the propaganda for the liberation movement during its long and bloody war with the French. And he was pretty good at this stuff. Uh, and then he was an ambassador and did various other things, but he was a good friend. And he told me once, when you have a bad story, never apologize, always explain. Because if you can explain the logic that people are following, why they're doing something, then often you can walk, even if you don't persuade them that you're right, you can walk away with respect that you have a reason for doing what you're doing. It's not just, you know, some arrogant uh, decision or preference of the imperial power, but there's a logic behind it. It's terribly important to master that. And it's particularly important to master it because frankly, the State Department's pretty poor at doing it. Um, so my perspective is that from the field, I really relied on my public diplomacy officers to give me this extra feel uh, for not only what was in the news, what was behind the news, what were the journalists talking about in a more repressive press culture, what would the journalists be talking about if they were actually free to write everything they thought. So I'll shut up there and pass to Mignon and to Ambassador Doherty. Well, Ambassador Doherty, I'm, I'm curious, as a public diplomacy practitioner in the field, and then later a PD career track uh, ambassador, what are your thoughts about this sometimes disconnect between what happens in Washington and what is used for consumption in the field? You know, I think when we were talking about the consolidation um, in 1999, uh, there was, after consolidation, greater coherence on um, talking points. Um, when it was USIA, there was always a little bit of a disconnect because press policy points were coming out of the State Department and that was a completely different chain. So there was definitely um, a disconnect. But the other thing that as Ambassador Newman has just pointed out, sometimes the policy points that you were getting are um, extraordinarily wooden and in, in Iraq um, and other places. That was very much the case, which is why it is really important that a public um, diplomacy officer have that breadth of, of, of contact base. Um, again, understanding everything in the local press, but where a public diplomacy officer can bring something special to the table as well is by working really closely with the political officer and understanding you know, what they're doing and the econ officer and the other agencies that are at the mission. But they also can bring a perspective of, as Ambassador Newman pointed out, what are the journalists that are writing these stories in um, state controlled systems, what are they actually thinking, not what are they writing? So again, give them the same opportunity to explain a bad story, just as Ambassador Newman said, sometimes we have bad stories that we need to explain as well. But the other thing that I think that the public diplomacy officers, when things work really well, is when that cultural affairs aspect with the information affairs aspect is merged together. Um, a public diplomacy officer can bring a lot to an ambassador and to a whole country team by saying, well, this is what students are saying. This is what university um, professors are thinking. This is what our future, our, our, our recent international visitors have come back with. So to be able to combine that, um, but be very integrated with the front office and with the political and economic sections and other agencies, 
um, really does help ameliorate the wooden one size fits all policy points that are coming from Washington. And then perhaps one really important characteristic um, that any good public diplomacy officer now, um, before too, but especially now needs to have is how to work um, constructively with Washington to make some of those wooden points a little bit more um, um, subtle um, and supple um, than they, 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 they sometimes are written. And that requires a really pretty good understanding of how Washington ticks and who to speak with there to get a little bit more than just the, the boilerplate. Um, again, would, 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 would pass it um, to, to Mignon to hear you know, what her recent experiences have been in some particularly sensitive um, um, areas, you know, in Sudan in particular, but also in South Africa. Exactly. So Mignon, tell us, as the person who has to draft these points, what does that look like? Are you free to just, you understand what's going on in country, so you're going to write the stuff and then off it goes to the embassy, or is there a different process? That's a great question. And I think what we are painting for you is a picture of how dynamic public diplomacy work is. As a public diplomacy officer, as the ambassadors have mentioned, you want to ensure that you're in those discussions about policy so that you can provide those tidbits and updates and guidance based on your contacts and your networks. The way it was explained to me is you don't want a cake to be baked in public diplomacy to just be the little icing on top. You want the, the public diplomacy aspect to be baked in with the cake itself, with the policy itself. And that means as public diplomacy officers, particularly when I was working with the Sudan office, that meant when I was thinking about a press statement that we were about to draft or press talking points that not only did I talk internally with our offices within Washington that may have equities on our policy, that could be our partner countries in Uganda or Ethiopia or Kenya or countries um, who are also really having um, some, some serious sort of impact on our South Sudan policy in Europe or working with our human rights offices, that also meant that I really wanted to reach out to my contacts in the diaspora as well, reaching out to folks who have some vested interest in us getting our policy right and articulating it right. And that's how a public diplomacy officer can play a huge role and be very valuable. We also, not only are we writing statements, but we're also prepping our ambassadors to speak publicly to the press. And we wanna make sure that they can articulate this and they feel comfortable and confident. And I used to, when I was working with my ambassadors, tell them that you're not speaking to that journalist. You're speaking past that journalist to the people in this country. What do we want them to know? What do we want them to understand about our policy and walk away with? And so it's just such, a, it's such an important role we play in supporting policy. It means that we have to be very integrated. We have to follow Twitter. We have to follow Facebook. We have to watch for influencers in the country to see what they're saying so that we are two steps ahead and we can anticipate the types of questions the ambassador will see when he delivers those talking points. So we can say, well, sir, you're going to say this line and this is how the journalist is going to respond. This, these are the questions they're going to follow up with. And here's the best way to answer that. And so as a public diplomacy officer, it's just such an exciting opportunity to not only get in front of policy and support it, but also ensure that our foreign audiences understand it, um, can get behind it, and, and can join us in, in support of our policy as well. So Mignon raises a couple of really good points. Um, the first is that besides knowing what's going on and being able to anticipate how that messaging is going to be received, there's back end work back in Washington and also out in the field. Uh, a couple of parts that we didn't talk about uh, before in the Secretariat are the Global Engagement Center. That center is responsible for recognizing, understanding, and exposing, and most importantly, countering foreign and state, uh, foreign state or non-state propaganda and disinformation. So it doesn't matter how hard we work to get it right. There are people out there, there are entities out there, they're very, very vested in making sure that there's going to be some disinformation. So it's not just, I've got to make sure that my ambassador has everything that he or she needs. I also have to be concerned about what about uh, disinformation, purposeful, strategic disinformation, and how are we going to counter that? 
Uh, the second is the Office of Policy Planning and Resources. So if all of this sounded complicated, imagine it has to be budgeted. We don't just make this stuff up. There are long-term strategic planning and performance measurement goals that are in place. So exactly how are we doing with our messaging? That's important because if you wanna make sure that that is funded, I wanna be able to say to my ambassador, look, I'm gonna ask Washington for more money for this thing. And Washington's going to ask, well, how well did the last thing go? And, and can you prove that it actually deserves to be funded? So that office is very important as well. I want us now to talk a little bit, now that you have an understanding of how we're structured, the way that we're structured in Washington plays out very similarly at post. So many outside of the house, the information officer side of the house. I'd like for us to talk a little bit about the different parts of the work when you're at post. So cultural affairs officers, information officers, and then head of the section, public affairs officers. And I would love to hear from both um, Ambassador Doherty and Mignon. I think Mignon ought to start because she's been doing it and we're all in the long in the tooth and out of, out of practice. Not at all, Ambassador, but I'm happy to jump in there. As Yolanda said, one of the nice things about the public diplomacy role is that you get a chance to sort of play two different sides of the PD house. You get to work as a press officer and write those talking points and work with Washington on making sure that the policy is drafted well, that it can be received well in country. We're also working with journalists in country to ensure that journalists, if they have questions about US foreign policy, that they can come to us. They are our contacts as press officers. They'll write us and say, hey, the White House just put out this statement. Can you give us an interview from the ambassador on what it means or what this will mean for our country? And as a press officer, I will sort of coordinate that ambassador's interview with the press. Not only do we work with press, but we also support press training. So we have, as public diplomacy officers, we have a certain amount of funding that we receive from Congress to be able to support journalists abroad. And that can be with exchange programs. It can be with training programs. It's a great opportunity for us to build our networks with journalists. And in addition to the press side, we also work on social media. So we know that social media is uh, one of the most important ways to get messages out for many different audiences. And at the State Department, we understand that well, and we are integrated on social media platforms, whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook, um, we have Instagram as well. And so we work all of those platforms to get our messages out. Um, and we also just review blogs to see what's being said about our foreign policy so that we can respond to that as well. And so we have, those are the, I guess, main highlights I would say on the press side and I'll let Yolanda pick it up if I, if I miss something. And the cultural side of the house is also another really important side. Our cultural aspect as a cultural affairs officer, you're really responsible for building relationships and promoting American values and culture through a number of different resources. And those resources look like educational exchanges, they look like grants to different organizations that are doing great work that supports American policy. It also looks like bringing over American speakers or scientists or professionals to meet with their counterparts in that country and build those relationships and tips and guidance in their field. And we also bring over cultural groups like jazz music musicians or bluegrass musicians or Misty Copeland dancers and other professional artists and athletes as part of the sports diplomacy program to showcase American culture. And why do we do this? Because we understand that although we might be in a country where they might not favor our policy, sometimes it's pretty easy to have them show up to a concert by a, a jazz musician. And so that gives us an opportunity to then showcase American culture and hopefully change some hearts and minds about American policy along the way, or at least uh, support the idea that America is here to be a friend and to be an ally and to work together. And so that's our cultural aspect of the house. The cultural program is really, it's, it allows you to be creative. You work with, um, entrepreneurs, you can work with um, groups that are music groups abroad, uh, academic groups abroad, think tanks. Uh, you can work with all sorts of folks who are really creative in the country to build those cultural ties. I know Yolanda and I have great stories just about touring some American cultural artists and what it feels like to put on a concert abroad with 
an American group to put on a show or play with an American group abroad. It really allows us to connect with people and to, and to build those relationships. And often we see people come back years later and say, you know what, I really had a certain view about the United States, but I attended this event or this speaking engagement or this program or this English language program, and it, and it changed my mind. And that's what we're here for, right, as, as American diplomats. We also have several tools under our belt that support both the press side and the cultural side. We have what we call American Corners around the world, and these are establishments that help promote our American policy and culture. Uh, they're often located in universities or in libraries, and they're just an open uh, area where students can use computers or they can use lab uh, like uh, IT equipment or they could use uh, coding equipment. Um, we have a lot of speaking engagements there, programs there, and they're all free. Um, we do our Education USA programs there, which mean we can showcase US universities and what we offer and the admissions process to help encourage students, foreign students to attend US universities. So I, I would say as a public diplomacy officer uh, on the press side, and then you have the cultural affairs side, and at the very top, you have a public affairs chief who will sort of oversee the entire PD side, look at our budget, ensure that our programs are strategic and that our programs are in line with the embassy's mission. And that's the most important thing, right? As a PD officer, when I come to a mission, the first thing I wanna know is, what does that ambassador see as his primary goals or our mission for this, for our, um, our stay here in the country? What should we be focused on? Economic development, security development, human rights, and as a PD officer, all of our programs will support those mission goals. And I guess hopefully that helps Yolanda just paint a picture of the press side and the cultural side, and I'll hand it back over to the ambassadors to elaborate a little bit more. Thank you. I would love to hear, um, well, as, as Mignon said, frequently the public affairs officer and cultural affairs officer serve as grants officers. So when we're out with the ambassador, it's a big oversized check and it's a lovely ceremony. Uh, someone who had to research that organization, write that grant, make sure that it's within all the regulations and then fund it, frequently that is the public affairs officer. So if you're thinking about um, how you can start your career very early, managing people and resources, uh, PD is one of the, the career tracks that allows you to do so early in the career. We're gonna talk a little bit more too about what the job looks like early in the career, mid-career, and then later. But I also wanted to, before we leave this, touch a little bit on the interagency and how it all works together. So I've joked with a couple of ambassadors um, by saying, you know, there are only three of us in the building that really have to know a little bit about everybody's everything. That is the ambassador, of course, uh, the deputy chief of mission, and whoever is going to the podium. Because if you serve as the mission spokesperson, you must be able to do so with accuracy. So our colleagues in USAID, they are able to focus on development. That's what they do. Our colleagues at CDC focused on um, you know, disease prevention. All of that's great. That's what they do, DOD, et cetera. But if you are the mission spokesperson and you're going to the podium in whatever language, you have to know exactly what's going on. And that too comes back to PD work. It's a bird's eye view of the entire mission, all of the agencies that are present, because uh, we do serve as the focal point for messaging for the entire mission. So if agencies want to talk about press release or how am I going to get my information out about this type of program, ultimately that's going to come through the public affairs section. So working with the interagency is key. It's, um, I'd love to hear a little bit from each of you, the three of you, about interagency equities. Uh, I have worked with MIST teams, that's Department of Defense has specific um, information teams that come out to, uh, to post in some instances to do really strategic messaging. Uh, that was my first sort of work with DOD, but I'd love to hear about the interagency and equities and making sure that PD has enough of a view of everybody's equity at the table. I'd like to start with you, Ambassador Dewey. Um, you know, it's a really good question and, and, and it can be um, a tough one. Public diplomacy has to make sure that other agencies at post realize that it is in their interest as well to make sure that their message gets out coherently. And that is, you know, from, you know, the front office, from the ambassador, 
if you can convince them that the story isn't so much about their particular agency or their particular program, but about what the entire mission is doing and how that reflects American goals, and most importantly, how it um, reflects American values, um, you're going to be successful at it. But as Yolanda has already said, that requires that you be one of the people at the mission that has a real strong awareness of who is doing what and why it matters. So if you're able to articulate that, you're helping USAID promote its development um, goals and objectives, and you're helping um, your ambassador when she goes out to say, this is what the United States is doing in this particular country. It's not always an easy task, and the larger the mission, the more complicated it can be. Sometimes um, with Department of Defense, at, um, and Ambassador Newman would be better than anyone in talking about um, um, sometimes contradictions that will, you know, from a military command perspective in a particular country, as opposed to the chief of mission, that's a delicate balance that sometimes works really, really well, um, but sometimes doesn't. But again, in thinking of a career in public diplomacy, it shows you why it's kind of exciting um, to, to, to be part of that, because you do need to have a finger on, uh, you know, every thing that is going on at your particular mission so that you can help coordinate, not get in anybody's way, but to get a clear, coherent message out um, that works to everybody's advantage. But I think Ambassador Newman would probably um, have the most experience on, on seeing how it can work well and where it hasn't well, worked. I, yeah, I've seen it work well. I've seen it work disastrously. Um, I think one thing that's important to understand is ambassadorial authority. Um, as an ambassador, you have authority over every civilian agency of the U.S. government represented in your country. You have authority, in fact, over military elements represented in your country, unless they are part of what is called a unified command. Then they're under separate military command. And so for them, you have suasion and influence, but you can't order. So for, you know, for AID or other elements of your mission, and hopefully they will be appropriately influenced, understandably, or, you know, or seduced or whatever by the skill of the public diplomacy officer. But in a pinch, you can tell them, damn it, get in line. You cannot do that with, with the uh, combatant command. They, they're separate. And to add to the complexity, they're often very well intentioned. They're also extremely well resourced. They got a little bit more money than we do. Um, they don't always understand the culture very well. And, and they have a rather rigid clearance program so that they are absolutely not set up to be a rapid response organization, except in sort of dogmatic cleared points. Now, if you have, the ambassador has the right influence with an understanding commander, you can improve this. It, but it comes down to the ambassador and public diplomacy officer being able to persuade their military colleagues that there's a way to go about this stuff. Uh, otherwise, there's a tendency to fall back on technology and on explaining. And, and let's give me two examples. My experience with French, Arabic, and Persian is that if it, it, French, my French is pretty good, my Arabic is now deteriorated and my Persian is rapidly following it. But um, in every case that I know, if you write a statement in English and ask your local employees to translate it, it comes out reading like something designed by a foreigner. You have got to, it, you get, you got to work with them to get the themes, but have them write it in a way that is natural to the cultural expression. That is not normally what the military tends to do. They tend to want to write it themselves. There's a whole book on uh, American propaganda in Afghanistan, a fellow named Tom, Dr. Thomas Johnson wrote it, um, contrasting Taliban propaganda with American. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard reading because we're sort of pathetic um, that they were dealing in a cultural milieu, which they understood. They were using poetry and storytelling. 
<coughs> we were dropping leaflets <coughs> that made absolutely no sense to an Afghan unless they could read the caption and most of them were illiterate. Uh, so it gets really basic sometimes. And it's, it's fascinating work because you can, you know, the military wants to do it well. And they often have great resources to bring to bear, but they don't necessarily have the, the cultural background or the political background to tune the message. And you're not going to get any place by telling them, geez, you guys are stupid. Uh, you know, you, you've got to be able to persuade them there's a better way. Now, I, I learned this from an Egyptian ambassador once who told me, you know, if you start off by saying you're wrong, the first thing I do is go into a defensive huddle. Um, I can't use that expression, but, you know, I, I fight back. If you say, I understand what you're saying, but I have a different perspective, then you open my mind up to listen to you. And, and you need some of that as you're working with your military colleagues. So, you you know, it's not just for the foreigners. You've got to be a diplomat. You've got to learn how to be a very persuasive diplomat with your American colleagues that you can't order around. Sorry, that was kind of a long digression. No, it's um, you are well suited to speak to this because given uh, where you were chief of mission, those equities sometimes do get really complicated. Uh, I, I did see both both pieces because when I went to Baghdad, I went for the last six months of the occupation authority and the so-called coalition provisional authority, where the public diplomacy was a combination of uh, a civilian but not a professional and the military. And it was a disaster. And I would say that after the embassy was stood up and we turned sovereignty back to the Iraqis, it took us probably the better part of a year to really reestablish some credibility with the journalists uh, because the excess of spin had caused permanent disbelief to set in. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about what the career looks like domestically and overseas early, middle, and senior. So I'd like to give a couple of examples of what you can expect when you first join the Foreign Service, which is what most people are focused on. Hey, I'm gonna join the Foreign Service and my first couple of jobs, my first three or four tours are going to be this. But this is a career. And so the trajectory of the, uh, of the career is important also. So early on, when you first join the Foreign Service and have your first public diplomacy, um, your first public diplomacy tours, you can expect uh, a range of things. Overseas, you can expect positions like uh, to be a, an assistant cultural affairs officer or an assistant information officer. In that case, uh, depending on the size of the embassy, you may be responsible for an entire portfolio of international visitor leadership program um, exchanges, for example, or uh, all of the Fulbright exchange program, or perhaps all visiting speakers. It's hard to know because it depends on the size of the mission. Domestically, you could expect if you have a, a PD tour domestically, you could expect to work in any of the bureaus that we talked about today as, again, an assistant to someone who is working on a broader portfolio. So perhaps you would be in the office um, looking at Fulbright candidates who are honestly to be suggested to a mission to, uh, to be reviewed. Or um, it could be that you are working um, as perhaps an assistant to what Mignon was doing uh, to prepare the various spokespersons for um, their murder boards and for also for the content that they're going to put together. Mignon, tell us a little bit about what you can expect at the mid-level and Ambassador Dory, please, at the senior level in PD, both at home and abroad. Great question, Yolanda. At the mid-level NPD, you can expect to start sort of taking on a little more responsibility when it comes to the drafting of talking points in Washington. You will likely be the individual who, if you're working on, in a policy office, say for instance, Sudan and South Sudan, you'll attend the policy meetings. You'll then come back from the policy meeting draft, the first draft of a press statement and then send it around. One of our ambassadors mentioned clearances. That means you're sending it to other offices who might have equities or interest in that statement to ensure everything you've drafted is accurate and concise and clear. We're saying what we need to be saying and it's in line with our overall uh, US policy. And so they will make 
lots of edits. Uh, I remember when I started out, I, I came from a liberal arts background and I was probably using a more creative and passive voice. Um, I had lots of edits on what I thought was a beautiful written statement, um, but we write in a very active tone and active voice at the State Department. And so they will ensure that it's strong before it, was, it is released. And so you get a lot of, uh, a lot of responsibility and opportunity to write those statements to be uh, supportive of those sorts of um, issues. You also get a chance to make more recommendations, I think at the mid-level, make recommendations to the team as far as where we should go on policy, who we should include. Uh, you get an opportunity to work with mid-level officers who are also doing similar things in the other offices to sort of collaborate on different programs that you can do together that will support your office and your goals. And at the mid-level, you might also have the opportunity to manage uh, another officer who is working in your section. So you might have another American officer supporting your section on the press side and you could be their manager at the mid-level. Now, when you think about the mid-level overseas, you will definitely have an opportunity to manage people. Those people could not only could be American citizens who are US officers, or they could be our local staff. And our local staff, as you know, are an important aspect of our work. They um, man all of our US missions, our embassies and consulates, so they're in all of our sections, and they really are the bread and butter of our sort of our resources, our networks, because they stay there much longer than we do as diplomats. When we change every one, two or three years, our, our local staff will be in that position and they really know the section well. And so as a mid-level officer, you might have the opportunity to manage them at that level. And, and you'll also have an opportunity to manage money at the mid-level as, as a public diplomacy officer. We talked about grants, and so you'll have a chance to do that as well. So that's what I would say at the, at the mid-level, Yolanda. And Ambassador Doherty, we all aspire to be senior public affairs officers or PD officers. Uh, and then obviously uh, we're all hoping at some point to uh, become ambassadors. I'll, I'll speak in the royal we here. And then finally, what might that look like at the senior level domestically? Sorry, um, you know, the one thing I would add on, um, and, and I think this is something that's um, special, uh, can be special about public diplomacy is what you've already said about entry level and mid level. Um, I think if you're an ambitious public diplomacy officer and a really engaged in an interesting one, particularly in the field overseas, um, you sometimes have the opportunity to do things that some of your colleagues in other tracks don't have to do. Um, even as a very junior officer, um, if you're dealing with international visitors, you're in the situation where you're meeting people um, and trying to identify people that you think are going to be leaders, whether it's in government or academe or journalism or the arts 20 years from now. Even if you're not the grant manager, you are still dealing with how grants are administered. So one advantage that sometimes public diplomacy officers can have both when they're um, entering and at mid-level that is really important to them as they get into a more senior level is that they do have that type of management experience, whether it's managing programs, resources, um, um, people, um, that sometimes in, in other sections um, you don't have that same opportunity to do. You also have the opportunity to do a lot of reporting, and by the time you're getting to be mid-level and certainly the senior level, a good public diplomacy officer should be contributing to the type of reporting that a mission is doing. And that's not always um, something that public diplomacy had thought was part of their bailiwick, but writing about the educational scene or the journalistic scene or um, you know, just basic bread and butter reporting on what conversations you've had with people um, can qualify you to do all sorts of things. So one thing at a senior level that I would no matter which track you're interested in, I don't think I would ever decide that what I wanted to do at the very beginning is to end up in a particular job, whether it's an ambassadorship or a, uh, you know, a very senior public affairs officer position or a DCM position. It should be the work itself that is most interesting for you. If that happens, things will start working themselves out in, in one way or another. Um, the public diplomacy officers that I've seen, um, you know, before they retired that have the biggest impact, um, sometimes never were ambassadors or in front office positions. Um, sometimes, you know, they were deputies of, of, of military commands, or sometimes they had really senior positions back in Washington on um, coming up with those policy points that, that um, Mignon was talking about. So what I think at a senior level, a good public diplomacy officer has the opportunity to do is to bring together all of those experiences. And there are a really wide variety of experiences that you have 
on people, on press, on policy, on, on personnel, on programs, on management. To tie them together, you can bring something um, of increased value, um, both to the mission and back in the interagency and at the State Department back in, in, in Washington. Certainly, if you're looking um, to have that possibility, however, of working in a front office as a deputy chief of mission or a chief of mission, um, I think public diplomacy can qualify you to do that very well because of the breadth um, of types of experiences that you have. Thank you very much for that. So I want to be um, mindful of the time so that we leave enough time for folks to ask questions. I think there might have been a few that have gone into the chat. We wanted to talk to you about, uh, because we get this question a lot, DRs do, what should I be studying? Tell me the magic list of things that I should be studying. So when you registered for this session, you received an email and attached to it was the most recent uh, suggested reading list. That list was updated just last month, so it really is the most recent uh, that we have based on um, the content of the Foreign Service Officer test. So those are materials that are for your use. I'll put a link to it in the chat if you don't have uh, your copy of it. But for uh, suggested courses, uh, the State Department also maintains a list that's exhaustive of, of lots of courses. But uh, I'd like for each of us just to talk a little bit about something that you think might be useful for folks who might be looking at this job. And I'll start. When I have shared with people, my doctorate is in religious studies, largely peace and conflict. When I've shared that with foreign service officers, I have rarely met someone who didn't say, you know what? I wish I'd taken a comparative religion course when I was in whatever, because there are so many theocracies around the world, understanding them and being able to function within them is without having to be a quick study is definitely a benefit. So if you are still in school, I really urge you to think about a comparative religion course. Uh, if you're not, read, you know, read broadly about what those structures look like around the world. Mignola and then uh, both ambassadors. Absolutely, Yolanda. I would just add that as a spokesperson, as a public diplomacy officer, I think it's valuable to watch our State Department spokespeople. That's Ned Price and Jelena Porter, uh, also the White House spokesperson, if you'd like, but definitely pay attention to those press briefings. They're really valuable just to see how we speak about the press, how we speak about foreign policy, and it helps you understand how we articulate our, our policy objectives. So that's what I would recommend. Master Doherty? I think what I would recommend, I, and I think this is why public diplomacy is a really good field. Um, I told you um, that when I joined, um, the system was a little bit different and you could choose among the different ones. I think public, um, public diplomacy can be really good for somebody who can't make up their mind on exactly what it is that they do want to do. Um, you know, you, if, if you are really interested in cultures, and it can be from you know, a comparative religion perspective, it could be from an agriculture perspective, history, um, culture, um, journalism. Um, I would just as broadly as possible, um, um, any field is important. Um, Yolanda pointed to that, I think, on the webinar on Saturday that she did, that people come in and they go, oh, well, I don't know if I really can be a foreign service officer. I didn't major in international relations in university. It doesn't matter. Um, what matters is a good foundation a great interest um, in, in your own um, um, government and your own culture, but foreign cultures as well, and particularly for public diplomacy, just being genuinely interested in immersing yourself completely in the language, culture, background, um, policy, government, um, economy of a foreign environment um, is exactly the type of characteristics that you need, and you can get them from a variety of, of foundational backgrounds. Ambassador Newman, any wise thoughts about course study or readings that might be useful? You know, it, it's going on half a century since I took the foreign service exam. So I think you're going to have to be pretty careful about any advice based on that. And the exam has changed a great deal since then. It, I would say in terms of being a good, I can talk about being a good foreign service officer. Um, and hopefully some of that will be tested on the exam. But you know, that's the ability to listen, first of all, to, to hear. Uh, it's the ability, it's the ability to be empathetic with other cultures, does not mean sympathetic. You don't have to agree with them. You have to understand where they're coming from. 
Uh, and then hugely important, and I think it is from what I hear still relevant to the exam, is the ability to speak and write clearly. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a believer in the, I know what I think, I can't quite say it, but I know what I think. No, you don't. If you can't say it, you don't know. Um, and uh, a lot of times you need to be able to explain what you think very clearly and succinctly. You need to write that way. Um, I don't know that computers have been God's gift to creative writing. They seem to tend to leave us to ramble. Um, so learning to be your own editor and learning to, you know, I, I'll tell you, I mean, I write a lot of op-eds, a lot of published newspaper pieces and things like this. And after a first draft, I tear that thing apart. Uh, shorten the sentences, make it more concise. And you can, you won't, can't necessarily be God's gift to style, but you can learn to edit yourself. Uh, whether that helps you in the foreign service exam, I don't know, but it sure will help you get your papers out. So true. With that, I would like to um, invite participants to uh, please place your questions in the chat. Frequently, people have similar questions, and so Mayarni is going to review those. As you do that, I'd like to ask the panel uh, one big old question, which is, you know, what do you wish you'd known about PD before you started? And I will, st I will start and be very brief. I wish I had known how proud my country was going to make me when I took this job and the work that we're doing. Because I really expected to come in and be um, a dissenting voice that, you know, oh no, I've got to figure out how to, you know, get this perspective through. And what I found was um, a group of people who are whip smart, um, an agency that is deliberative purposely, that measures twice and cuts once, um, and a, an agency that uh, recognizes and encourages uh, dissenting views. You may not always get uh, your view through, but you can be somewhat guaranteed that your deputy chief of mission and your ambassador are going to hear you. And so I just wish I'd known um, about the structure and the culture of the State Department before I joined. But Mignon and then both ambassadors, what do you wish you'd known specifically about PD before you came in? It's a great question, Yolanda. I think I would agree that there's so many resources in, within the public diplomacy cone when it comes to cultural resources, like our exchanges and our grants and our programs and on the press side. I wish I had really appreciated how much we have at our disposal as public diplomacy officers. I think my first or second tour, I could have been a little more creative. I could have thought bigger. You know, I think as PD officers, we, we, we are told, you know, you get in, you think big, but you can always think bigger. And those resources are available with the Department of State. And, and I wish I had really just dug in deep and learned about all those resources before diving into my job um, and getting excited about, you know, going to work every day, really studying what the department offers and knowing how to utilize those resources uh, to, to advance foreign policy abroad. Ambassador Dewey? You know, I, following up on what the two of you have said, because I agree with you both, I think what I would have liked to have known a little bit much better yeah, um, is the whole interagency process and, and um, what else is out there and not to be too inward looking. And the other thing, just building on what you said, Yolanda, about dissent, not just within the mission, but I think, you know, um, um, Mignon, you had said it when you first go to a, a mission, you want to know what the ambassador's priorities are. And invariably, an ambassador's priority is going to be projecting American values. And those American values do include dissent and discussion and showing both sides of the issue, even within America. And projecting that honesty, I think, um, helps us understand more empathetically um, foreign cultures and to explain our own better to them. So I wish I'd known all of those things as well. But I certainly would look outside of just State Department and try to learn at the whole of government, which is something that public diplomacy, um, would it was a bit counterintuitive um, for me at the very beginning. And Ambassador Newman, our non-PD career track officer, what do you wish you'd known about PD before you joined the Foreign Service? Well, I find that, I'm sorry, I'm not I'm in a weird position because my first embassy experience was out of graduate school going off to Afghanistan where my father was ambassador. 
And so my, my first diplomatic experience was seeing a mission from the top down uh, through the ambassador's eyes, which was extraordinarily useful because when I came into my first embassy, you know, I kind of got an idea what an ambassador was, what a DCM was, what they wanted. What I realized later was I did not have the entry-level officer perspective uh, of what people go through. And when they haven't had that somewhat unique perspective, I had to get that intellectually, you know, by talking to other people in order to be a better supervisor. But the result was I had a kind of unusual overview of an embassy when I when I came in. And so I, I mean, there were any number of individual things that obviously I learned as I went along. Um, Particularly, how you know how you've got to deal with guidance, uh, and you know, there's a wonderful comment from uh, Ambassador Chaz Freeman, who says at one point he writes, he said, "If you want a message delivered, get a postman. If you want to get something done, get a good diplomat and tell him what you're trying to accomplish for her, and let them go work at it." Uh, Often what you get from Washington is language that has been fought over uh, by people. Everybody's got to get their own piece in. And sometimes you look like an idiot if you recited all this stuff. It, sometimes you really need to use it because it's issues you don't know anything about. But sometimes you need, you need an understanding of policy so you know how far you can go in adapting what you've been given using it or disregarding it. And you can't freelance on that. You've got to really understand what your kind of left and right limits are in order to be able to not use everything the way it is written. Uh, and, and that's a skill that takes some work. And I'm not sure it's your question. Well, no, that, that answered my question. I hope that puts in perspective for folks who are thinking about joining us. What this what this looks like and how you need to be thinking about it as you as you are preparing for both the exam and more importantly for the career after the exam. So we do have some questions in the in the chat. Uh, there's a question about language facilities. So um, as we know in the Foreign Service, for every Foreign Service officer, language acquisition and maintenance is key. Uh, but the question is, how well prepared did the panel feel? By um by the language training before heading out to post. Well, that depends so much on the language. Um, we have some really really good officers in all kinds of languages, um, but I will say that one thing a PD cone gives you is probably as much or more experienced chance to use a language in an early stage of your career. And if you're the economic officer, you're gonna deal with a whole lot of people, whether you're in an Arab country or you know, Afghanistan, you're dealing with a lot of people with Western educations. Um, and if your Arabic is lousy, you know, they'll switch into English. In fact, your Arabic may decline. Um, but if you're the PD officer, you're gonna be dealing, you know, whether it's culturally or press, you're gonna be dealing with a lot of people who don't have the equivalent English level. Mm -hmm. So it really gives you a chance to work in the language. If you want to perfect the language, it's a great cone. Ambassador Doherty? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I, I don't think uh, when you go out to a post and they, they tell you you're proficient, you discover in about 10 minutes that you're not proficient enough. Um, and you're going to feel that way for the, the, the duration of your time there. But I agree very much with Ambassador Newman. You have the opportunity to speak almost every single day on a, on a number of different um, um, levels. And in fact, it's part of your job to do so. So you do have an advantage over somebody who's you know, writing up detailed reports in English and has just been to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and maybe conducted their conversation in English, even with their interlocutor. So um, you get what you need to start out with. Um, but what you want to do as a public diplomacy officer is to go out and use it from day one and use it over and over again. And you can. Manana, I know you studied Spanish, so you came to the, the State Department with Spanish as I did. How did you feel? Um, you were, were you well prepared with French? 
That's a, that's a great question. I mean, when, it, when we talk about the romance languages, you receive usually six months of training and that training is like a job. You're getting paid to study that language uh, for those six months in a small class of maybe three to four students with a native speaker. And so it is, it's intense training and they will test you throughout those six months to see if you are gaining in your reading and your writing, I'm sorry, reading and your speaking ability. Um, I, as Yolanda said, I came in with Spanish, but for French, I had the full six months. And I felt like, as the ambassador already said, I, I felt pretty comfortable. I thought I was ready to go. And then you get on the ground and you realize the newspaper articles are a little harder than the ones you were reading in, in your classes and the conversations are going a little faster than the ones you practice, um, but you, you do end up getting pretty strong. And by the end of your time, you can have your staff meetings in, in French with your staff and that helps out. Um, you're able to speak from a civil society member to someone in the Ministry of Culture and you will, yeah, you'll feel pretty comfortable by the time you, you end. And it really do, does depend on you, right? Like with, um, if you feel when you get there that you just aren't strong enough to speak to a journalist or to speak to that professor, then you can always take extra courses. The Foreign Service Institute has um, virtual classes that they offer. You can, I end up getting a tutor for French on the side. I just wanted to make sure I was strong in that language. And so I don't think that everybody needs that, but it, you can, um, you can be as proficient as you want to in the language if you put in as, uh, put in the effort. We have another question, but uh, I will note that I went to post, I also had the full course of French and I went to post to feeling like, yeah, I could talk about almost anything when it came to foreign policy. I had a leak in my apartment my, the first night that I arrived and I have no idea how to say I have a leak. These are not things that we covered. Uh, for the record, plumber is plombier. These are really key phrases. So there are going to be parts of your of your uh, language education that you are as a as a as a you know private citizen. You're going to have to to beef up on. Uh, there's a question about um, as a public diplomacy officer, how do you handle a public relations debacle, something embarrassing or scandalous or anything from our own experience? And I will let the rest of you take it, but I will let you also know that. Um, when the former uh, president allegedly said uh, that there are some, and I'm going to quote the alleged quote, shithole countries, it was a Wednesday, and I know it was a Wednesday because I was in Kinshasa and my weekly pressers were on a Wednesday, and I was wondering why the earth was not opening up to swallow me um, on that on that Wednesday because I was at the podium on that day, and so um, remember in all things. Be honest, tell the truth. But please, for the panel, how do you handle a public relations snafu, if you will? Mignon? Sure. Dory? <laughs> you know, I'll jump in. I think you're absolutely right. These are never easy. Um, but this is what you're trained for, and you don't go out there alone as a spokesperson, right? You will make sure that you're communicating with Washington, you're communicating with your front office, your ambassador, your deputy chief of mission to ensure that what you're about to say and deliver is in accordance with what we would like as, a, as an embassy to be said. I do remember also with the last administration, it was uh, right around the time of the death of George Floyd, and a South African journalist wanted to ask our mission, you consulate in Cape Town, what did the US government think about what was happening and all the um, protests that were going on in the United States. And I volunteered to speak uh, on behalf of the mission in South Africa to take that first uh, interview. And uh, the ambassador was gave me the okay. And one of the questions was, things are going really bad in the United States right now. It almost looks like the new Jim Crow. Now, I expected some questions to be heavy hitters. I did not expect that. And, you know, at that moment, you have to rely on your training. You have to think about what are we here to say? We're here to showcase that we are a country that is continuing to develop and grow and that the president has asked for an expedited sort of review of what happened. And that's what we're, that's what we're moving on, that expedited review. And we, we are continuing to learn from one another. We have a lot uh, that we are going to sort of review during these protests to grow as a country. And you just have to be, I think, honest, but also rely on what is positive and what has happened that you can speak to. Um, but there are opportunities to, to showcase America's 
uh, perseverance and our strength. And I think that was that was one of them, but it was a question that I had not anticipated. And it was, uh, you know, it sort of touched for me as an African-American, it had a, a cultural sting there too, right? And so I think as diplomats, we come into the service with our own cultural backgrounds, language backgrounds, geographic backgrounds, and we bring that to the table as spokespeople. But when we're out there as a spokesperson, we're still representing the United States. And so that's something that we have to keep in mind. So I, that would be my example, Yolanda. Ambassador Doherty, did you ever have to- go um, I can't really here? top Mignon. I think what her answer is is exactly right. I, I, all of us, if you if you serve long enough, you'll have your own um, debacle or post, you will. and. Um, you can't always make them go away, but the one thing that I know for sure is that you can make them worse by trying to spin or lie. So when um, you are hit with the hard questions, the honest answer is correct. And Mignon's example of um, we're working to become a more perfect society. We're not saying that we are perfect. Um, people can understand that, um, but spinning and more spinning is not going to make it go away. It's going to make it worse. So, so true. There's a question about um, what the career tracks look like. Is it possible to focus solely in cultural or educational programs in the PD track, or is it always a mix of programs and press relations? So I'll let the two PDers talk to what that work looks like in the field. My experience is it can go either way. Um, um, you're always going to be advised to do a little bit of both, and I think it makes you a stronger officer if you do. Um, but there are always exceptions, and I've known people who um, just really focused either on the cultural side or the information side, and they had good, strong um, careers all the way through that they were happy with. Um, but the advice would be, and I, it, it's advice I would give as well, beyond PD, is just to expose yourself to as much as, as, as you can take um, on without losing um, what is um, most interesting and important to you and where you're, where you're best suited. Absolutely. I would just add that, you know, consider both sides. I came in as a communications major, but I love the cultural side. My first two jobs were cultural. And when I was looking at an assignment that had a press job, I was a little nervous about it um, because press is very different for the Department of State than it is as a, as a journalist working for a private uh, organization, but I loved my press job as well. And so I would just say, don't count it out. Spend time in both, as the ambassador mentioned, it will make you a stronger officer. If you understand the press side of the house, you're a better cultural officer. And if you understand the cultural programs, you're a much better press officer. So definitely think about, think about both sides. So true. I am a dyed in the wool cultural girl, right? Music is the Library of Congress. I really thought I would spend most of my career in cultural affairs. I've actually spent most of it in uh, press relations, media and press relations. Uh, I married a UN diplomat. And so some of the places that we've served uh, include Guinea Conakry, Cameroon, DR Congo. Those are some of the worst jailers of journalists on the continent. And so part of what we do, uh, what's so beautiful about what we do is um, press advocacy and freedom of the press as a, as a uh, international affairs issue and one that the United States speaks very strongly to. So I may go to the podium, I'm there, they're there to destroy me, that's their job, that's fine. But as I look out across the room, if I don't see someone, there are two things that go on in my mind. The first is, whew, did I, you know, did I get off easy today because so-and-so is not here? But then the other thing is, is he not here because he's detained? Is he not here because he's been arrested? And so there's a wonderful group in Kinshasa, uh, journalists in danger, journalists in danger, journalists in, uh, in danger, who really work very hard on uh, making sure that their colleague journalists um, live, frankly. So one of the great joys of this career has been, I've, I've on more than one occasion, been able to go to someone's wife, a journalist's wife and say, I know your husband's alive. I know so because I just left him. I saw myself to the jail. And I really challenge you to find what other career would allow you to have that kind of impact in real time on people's lives in that way. So think about it, which is not to say I don't love cultural affairs. I do. But um, I do think about the entire portfolio. It's, it's beautiful work. And you know, I would just add that in any cone in the Foreign Service, there's a certain element that I used to compare to going to work in a fire station. You put your hat and boots by the pole, you wait for the bell to ring, and then you just go. 
And so, you know, the one thing I would avoid is any notion that you're going to really control this career. We have a we have a question about, um, and then Myoni has a question. We have a question about um, Fulbright as the uh, flagship exchange program. Is there a different role for PD officers with a Fulbright commission in country versus a non-commission country? And you know, we have absolutely the right person on this panel to talk about this. So Ambassador Doherty, tell us the difference between um, working uh, with a Fulbright commission uh, and not. So my last visit, um, after I retired from the Foreign Service, um, I had at the Australian Fulbright Commission for five years and it's a really large program. Um, and, and that's why it's easy for me to answer this one. So Fulbright programs take place in all countries where we have, uh, pretty much all countries where we have embassies. If it's a small embassy, the public diplomacy um, section will actually be the administrators and be involved um, in, in the entire range of selection placement and, and care and maintenance of, 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 of Fulbrighters. But there are 53 countries um, around the world that have Fulbright commissions. Um, this is also great for PD um, because now in essence, you've subcontracted out to a commission and they're gonna do all of the administrative and bureaucratic work for you. And if you work really closely and well and um, sensitively with those commissions, you get the benefit of all of the um, contact work and the people work um, while they're taking care of the administration. So advice for people that would be really interested in Fulbright is, at a small post, volunteer to do everything so you understand the nuts and bolts of the uh, of, of the program. If you're fortunate enough to find yourself at a program with a really healthy, large commission, you can make a huge contribution. You'll probably be a board member to the commission, um, but you can really then um, uh, allow the commission to do much of the um, of the bureaucratic work, and you get the benefit of doing all of the contact work. Um, good evening, everyone. I just posted my question also, but I'll go ahead and say it out loud. So um, as an FSO, um, whether it's um, a public diplomacy officer or not a track, um, have any of you ever had uh, an issue or situation in which uh, you knew another culture so well, um, you were able to relate to that culture better than some other colleagues um and that may have caused other colleagues to question your loyalty to to um to the u.s or to um a, a specific u.s policy foreign foreign policy um just because you understood a culture or a situation better than they did I have not. Um, I will note that there's a, a grand difference between the United States and U.S. policy. So it and there's a question about disagreement with U.S. policy. So if you say in the Foreign Service for um, more than 15 or 20 minutes, I promise you there's going to be a policy with which you personally disagree, uh, and that's fine. But if you are in a situation where you feel that I just I cannot serve in the Foreign Service under X person in the White House, or if there's X policy, I just can't do it, then that's good that you know what your personal red lines are, but then this is not the job for you. Because this we don't take an oath to a person, we take our oath to the Constitution. And so there are going to be times when you disagree with, with a particular policy. Be honest, I have been honest about that. Uh, people have asked me specifically about, you know, X, Y, Z thing, and I, I will say in my official capacity what our policy is, and I also say, honestly, there are people in the United States, you know, X percentage of people in the United States, per the last poll, who disagree with said policy. We are a cacophony of opinions in the United States, and so when you're talking about policy, that's one thing, but I have never had my loyalty to the United States challenge, and I don't know if others have. Well, I I think I haven't had it quite in the sense that somebody challenged my loyalty, but there are times when you need to be able to look both ways. You, you need the empathy with the foreign culture to understand deeply 
as my old mentor, Hal Saunders, used to say, listen deeply enough to be changed by what you hear. But you also have to listen to Washington in order to know how to interpret that most useful. And I, I'll give you one example of trying to talk to you. We had a case when I was in Afghanistan, actually when I was on leave, where we had a fellow who'd been gone for 13 years and he came back and he wanted custody of his kids. And normally under Islamic law, the man gets custody after about age seven kids. But in this case, he had converted to Christianity and his wife to hold on to the kids brought this up. It was in an Islamic court because it was a custody case. And so he was sentenced to death uh, for apostasy. And this was a huge, huge issue. Uh, it was a huge issue in Afghanistan. It was a huge issue in Washington. And I thought I was on leave. I spent every single day of that leave on the phone, either with Condi Rice or Hamid Karzai or both. Um, and, and Karzai would say to me, um, you know, just let it, you know, don't say anything. I need some quiet. He's not going to get killed. I can handle this. And I would say, you know, you don't understand. We've got a Secretary of State who's the daughter of a Baptist minister. You've got an election in the United States. You've got an issue that appeals to the, uh, the liberals on the Democratic side about freedom of religion. Uh, and you've got an issue that appeals to the Republicans. Uh, about defending Christianity. And there's no way I can keep this thing quiet. Uh, while this was all going on, my good DCM uh, was back at post and one person wrote a cable. And the cable basically said to Washington, hey dummies, you don't understand how sensitive this thing is. Had that cable with that tone gone in that way, it would have killed our credibility in Washington. My DCM, who is an extraordinarily competent person, has gone on to be ambassador a few times. Um, we wrote the cable. It still conveyed how sensitive the issue was in Afghanistan, but it conveyed it in a way that showed the White House and the State Department that we understood, the embassy understood how important the issue was in Washington. It was the, abil so the ability to transmit that knowledge of, you know, we're, we're not sugarcoating this thing. This is really serious out here. But to say it in a way that makes clear that you understand why it's important in Washington, this is, if I could say this, it's kind of a microcosm of how you have to be able to speak two ways. It's not about lecturing truth to power. It's about influencing. And thank you so much for speaking uh, to both parts of those, uh, or both those questions, uh, because there was the other one about when you disagree with US policy towards the host country. And I think for those of us who are actually in country, uh, it's so frustrating, like, oh, but I'm here now, Washington, you need to understand better. So that is, that's a perpetual, I think, just sort of part of, of this work. And then we have uh, perhaps what is the key question for this evening, what I hope uh, all of you are able to take away as you look toward the Foreign Service Officer Test. And the question is, how can, you know, how can you craft your personal narratives if you intend to sit the exam in the PD cone? So the first thing I'm going to do is put in the chat the link to the personal narratives. This is important. They are six of the 13 Foreign Service dimensions. That's the first thing. So I don't want you to question or try to wonder or divine what the State Department means by intellectual skills or management skills or leadership skills. We've defined them clearly. They're on the slide that I sent you to. So first of all, understand what the State Department is asking you before you draft. Remember that these personal narratives are only 1,300 characters. That's around 220 words. So it needs to be clean, tight, pithy writing. And it needs to speak to whatever the example is that you're giving that's speaking to the prompt and also speaking to the actual public diplomacy career track. So we've talked a lot about what public diplomacy does in the field, domestically, early, middle and late in the career. 
Surely there are examples that you have. If you are coming to this from a finance background, we talked about the budget office. Someone has to figure out accountability. Um, are we going to fund these types of programs if they are not effective? They're looking at the efficacy. So your ability to view uh, how a program is carried out, these are things that perhaps you have done in clubs or um, fraternities or sororities at your, at your university. There are a million ways to go about drawing these examples from your personal life and from your uh, personal experiences and making them relevant to each of those six personal narrative prompts. So if you have a, a further or more pointed question about a particular experience that may be relevant to PD, we're happy to, to hear them. And I think we're small enough, you can just unmute yourself and ask it. I see a hand from Wayne Brown. Okay, please just un uh, unmute yourself, Wayne. All right. So again, those six personal narratives, if you go to the link that I sent you, and this link is also in the registration when you uh, an email that you received when you registered for today or for this session today. You, under tab six, it's going to tell you everything you need to know about, you know, starting in with the, um, with what can I expect for the FSOT and the personal narratives. So those six personal narratives, those prompts, leadership skills, communication skills, management skills, intellectual skills, and substantive knowledge. And I, I'm quite serious. I've heard it called a joke, but I'm quite serious. I was the world's worst waitress. I was a waitress for three days. Uh, those of you who work in hospitality, you have incredible skill sets in terms of your ability to multitask, your ability to, um, to work with people, cultural adaptability. That's huge. How some people react uh, when they're having meals and how they carry out those meals, that, that is very culture specific. So think more broadly about what your skill sets are, what your experiences have been, and then speak to uh, or write to the prompt. And 1300 characters, they go by very quickly. Even if you feel you are stating the very, very painfully obvious, you have to do so. The group of foreign service officers reviewing your work, your written products. These six personal narratives, which are your untimed writing, you can start drafting them now for the February FSOT if you wish. And then the timed essay that you're going to write on the day of the FSOT, those are all foreign service officers who are reviewing your written products. Remember for whom you're writing. Uh, remember that you have lots of ways to figure out how this organization communicates. Definitely, definitely, please do look at your dream embassy. Uh, you've heard uh, our ambassadors where they served. Click on those embassies and see some of the, um, the, the materials that are there. The, press releases and statements. Just get familiar with the way that we communicate and that, that will help to guide you. Uh, Nikki, you could just unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, thanks. I have two questions. The first one, I just wondered, are you going to post this online at any point or not for privacy reasons? The Academy has been kind enough to agree to post each of the five of these discussions on, uh, on its website. So you will okay, be able great. to on its platform, so you'll be able to reference those. Thank you so much. Also, uh, in addition to the 13 dimensions and the six precepts, is if you had to pick one word to describe what makes a successful public diplomacy officer in particular, what word would it be? That's a great question. I want each of the uh, panelists to, to answer that. But before we leave that, the precepts are not different. The six personal narratives are six of the 13 foreign service dimensions. So. Got it. But uh, who'd like to take it first? The word that captures public diplomacy office. Well, I will, um, because it's not mine, it's Ambassador Newman's, but honestly, I, I, the, the, the word I choose is empathy. If I had to choose one word, that would be a really good um, characteristic to, 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 to have as a public diplomacy officer. Adam, stolen your word, Ambassador Newman? What do you have? No, it's a good word. I, I was thinking more of the test than the skill. Yeah, I was thinking actually of two words, no BS. 
-hmm. you are going to be writing for people who have very highly developed BS filters. <laughs> so if if you pump up your if you pump up your adjectives, it doesn't do much. Uh, you're better to tell one small story that's specific that illustrates a point than to gush about how wonderful you are. But it's also true, you know, in meetings later on, um, the, the ability to cut cleanly to a, to a point, and and when you disagree, to state it without leaving too many bruises behind. You know, you know one of the one of the you know, key skill of being a dip diplomat is to get foreigners to do what you want them to do, and to like it enough that you can still work with them later. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not beat them over the head till they yield because then they hate you. Um, so that's part of it. Okay, I thought that wasn't one word and I talked too long. Mignon, for public diplomacy officers, what's that key word? You know, I was thinking the word amplify. We, you know, I think as PD officers, we amplify American culture, we amplify American foreign policy, we amplify relationships. Um, and then I, I looked up just now. Is amplifiers an actual word? And I think it is, but not for a person. I think it's an electronic <laughs> um, device. And so I don't know if that works, but I, I would say we amplify that. That's our job. <laughs> uh, I, I, yes, I would agree with everything that said. I would say adaptability because I am of little use to the State Department if I'm a rock star in London, but I fall apart in Bangui. And so the other thing to remember is that you're going to be carrying out these key public diplomacy, if you join the Foreign Service, these key public diplomacy skills in a variety of, of places. Uh, and that even if you have someone who's been in the same job, so I my tour in Kinshasa was quite different than uh, the tour that my predecessor had. Uh, she was there for three years. I, we're friends. I know her. I was there for three years also. During my three years, there were three Ebola outbreaks. During my three years, my family was evacuated three times for civil unrest. So same country, same job, um, a very, very different tour. So adaptability, I think, is going to be very key. Then I have a, a request to repost the updated reading list. So I'll repost the link to it. It was attached as a, sent to you as an attachment when you registered for today. So check your email. But I will also um, put a link to it so that you can download it. Unless there are any further questions, uh, we are a little over time. I want to thank our entire panel. Thank you so much. Our ambassadors are, I told you they were treasures. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I really hope to see some of you in an embassy or consulate someplace somewhere, because I have said to many ambassadors, I have the best job in the mission. Um, being a public diplomacy officer is it's been really just the joy and honor of my, of my life, certainly of my professional life. So I hope that you found this uh, useful and informative. I hope that you will also, even if you feel like, yes, public diplomacy is for me, uh, definitely do tune in for the rest of this series because it's going to be important for you, one, to understand how these career tracks work together. And secondly, there may be something that you hear in another career track, particularly if you've taken the quiz and you were very close. There's a, that split between Paul and PD is very, very common, as is a split between consular and management. So if you're trying to make up your mind about which, which career track might be right for you, the rest of this series is going to be very useful. So thank you very much for that. I will post quickly the link to the updated reading list. Any last words, Ambassador Newman, Ambassador Doherty? Oh, it was great to be with you. Uh, I really appreciated the insights from Ambassador Doherty and from Mignon and from you, Yolanda. And I would just say to people, this career was a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I often went home at night. There were times when I went home at night and I did not like the way some decision had come out. I never went home in 37 years in the business and wondered whether what I was working on mattered. That, that's an important feature in life. So I commend it to you. That is definitely the best last word. It's all very true. Thank you all and have a great, really good night. And we'll see you for the rest of this series.
we will be posting these on the academy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Yolanda. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thanks.